Hello everyone, and welcome to this online conference brought to you by the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and Israel's Haaretz newspaper. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Professor of Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. The UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies is committed to educating the general public in Los Angeles, the United States, and around the world about modern Israel, its history, culture, society, and politics. For this reason, we've partnered with Haaretz the third time now to bring you this online conference. Our first joint conference in November 2021 focused on Israel's national security challenges. Our last conference in February 2023 focused on Israel's foreign policy and foreign relations. This conference was originally going to address Israel's internal divisions and the challenges of social cohesion. But then a shocking and horrific event took place that changed everything. I'm referring, of course, to the surprise attack that Hamas conducted in southern Israel on October the 7th, just over five months ago, when some 3,000 members of Hamas's military wing and other Palestinian militants invaded Israel and went on to indiscriminately kill more than 1,160 people, mostly civilians, brutally raped women and abduct about 250 people, including children and elderly people, of whom around 100 are still alive and held in captivity in the Gaza Strip. October the 7th was the deadliest day for Israelis in the country's history. More Israelis were killed on that day than in any single day in any of Israel's wars or in the many previous terrorist attacks against Israeli civilians. October the 7th has been called Israel 9-11. The analogy is apt in many respects. Both events were by far the worst terrorist attacks in the country's history, and they both took place on home soil, where the country's citizens assumed the state would protect them. Both attacks left people terrorized and traumatized, fearful of a ruthless enemy, and shocked and humiliated by the fact that their enemies could carry out a surprise tax on such horrific scale. In both cases, the enemy had been underestimated. Israel's response to 10-7 also has some similarities with the US response to 9-11. The US invaded Afghanistan in order to destroy Al-Qaeda and topple the Taliban government that hosted it. Israel invaded the Gaza Strip in order to destroy Hamas and topple its government there. This war in Gaza is nothing like the previous rounds of fighting between Israel and Hamas. Those mini wars were devastating for Palestinians in Gaza with more than 4,000 killed and many more made homeless. This war is much bigger, much longer, and much more devastating. Five months into the war, more than 30,000 Palestinians, mostly civilians, have been killed and over 70,000 injured, according to Gaza's Ministry of Health. The majority of Gaza's 2.2 million people have been displaced and many are now on the brink of starvation. A humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding before our eyes. And as the world watches the carnage in Gaza and the death and suffering of so many innocent civilians, international criticism and outrage over Israel's conduct of the war is mounting and angry protests have been taking place around the world. Israel has even been brought before the International Court of Justice on charges of genocide. There's also been a surge of anti-Semitic and Islamophobic incidents in many countries, including in the United States. And in addition to all this, violence has spread across the Middle East, as Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, and Shia militia in Iraq and Syria have carried out attacks ostensibly in support of the Palestinians, drawing the United States into the fray. Gaza is at the center of global attention right now, but Israel itself is still reeling from the trauma of October the 7th, and Israelis are fixated on the fate of the hostages in Gaza. The trauma of October the 7th will last for a long time to come, which raises many questions. Is Israel now a different country than it was on October the 6th? What has changed since then? And what will be the long-term repercussion of October the 7th for Israeli-Palestinian relations, for Israel's foreign relations, for Israeli domestic politics and societal relations, and for Israel's relations with Jewish communities around the world. In the midst of war, these crucial questions have hardly been addressed, which is why the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and Haaretz have assembled four panels of experts to tackle them. The first panel will explore the impact of October the 7th 
on Israeli-Palestinian relations. The second will examine its impact on Israel's foreign relations. The third will discuss its impact on Israeli society and politics. And the final panel will look at its impact on the Jewish diaspora. I hope you will stay and watch all four panel discussions. We will also have one-on-one -on -one interviews with Yair Galon, former IDF Deputy Chief of Staff, who is now running for leadership of Israel's Labour Party, and with the New York Times columnist, Thomas Friedman, as well as an intimate conversation between Haaretz's diplomatic correspondent, Amir Tabon, and his father, Noam Tabon, former commander of the IDF's Northern Division, who heroically rescued Amir and his family from their home in Kibbutz Nahal Oz on October the 7th. Before I turn over to Haaretz's editor-in-chief, Aluf Ben, I'd just like to thank the Diane and Guilford Blazer Foundation for underwriting this conference and making it possible. We hope you will enjoy watching the conference and finding it to be thought-provoking, interesting, and informative. And now, over to Aluf. Dov and our partners from the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, my colleagues from Haaretz and all conference participants, I'd like to welcome you all to the third annual Haaretz UCLA conference dedicated to Israel after October 7th. No words can summarize the events in Israel since the beginning of last year better than unprecedented and unthinkable. Time and again, we've found ourselves dumbstruck and ill-prepared in the face of crises that are still threatening to tear apart the delicate fabric holding our society together. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's second comeback at the end of 2022, after being voted out 18 months before, ended the erstwhile political upheaval which had driven the country to five general elections in less than four years. The key figures in Netanyahu's new coalition were the ideological heirs of Rabbi Meir Kahana, once a despised far-right pariah and now setting the national tone. Together with Netanyahu, they hurried to implement their blueprint for a new version of Israel less democratic and more theocratic, and committed to pushing aside the Palestinians and frantically expanding West Bank settlements. Topping Netanyahu's agenda was a judicial coup in a country lacking any formal constitution and strong protection of civil rights. The clear and present threat to democracy prompted hundreds of thousands of citizens to launch Israel's widest ever protest movement. Week after week, in public squares all over the country, Hundreds and thousands of thousands of protesters chanted democracy and reservists vowed not to serve a dictatorship. By the spring of last year, Israel intelligence warned that the country's enemies, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and their ilk, were viewing the domestic rift as a strategic opportunity. War was imminent, warned intelligence, but Netanyahu was deaf to the alarm bells and would not halt the coup or reach out to the opposition. On October 7th, the warnings came true when Hamas surprised and invaded Israel all along the Gaza border, killing 1,200 Israelis, raping, looting, wounding, and kidnapping many others in what became Israel's worst ever calamity. From then on, our lives would be divided between pre- and post-October 7th. Israel's counterattack, now it's in six months, has failed so far to achieve its stated goals of destroying Hamas and bringing back the Israeli hostages from Gaza even after 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, large parts of Gaza turned into rubble, and most of the Strip's population squeezed into Rafah. President Joe Biden has given Israel unprecedented support in words and deeds, but growingly turned away from Netanyahu. And in one more unprecedented and once unthinkable development, Israel is standing accused at the ICJ in The Hague of committing genocide. The war still enjoys wide support among Israel's Jewish society, while the Arab society in Israel calls for immediate ceasefire and prisoner exchange. Wartime unity aside, the political turmoil is not over, as Netanyahu refuses to accept any responsibility for the October 7 tragedy, clinging to his far-right coalition to avoid an election in which, according to the polls, he is bound to lose. So far, the pre-war protest has failed to resurrect itself in calling for an early election. So an unpopular government is leading the country in a popular war alongside the same military leaders who had failed miserably on October 7th. Many questions are still looming large in the wake of last year's events. How the Gaza war will end and when will the hostages come back home? Will the Lebanese front explode in a full-scale conflict? When will the residents of the evacuated communities in the north and south of Israel return to their homes? Who will govern and rebuild Gaza 
And is Israel poised to establish a long-term occupation and even, as the far right demands, rebuild Israeli settlements there? Will the Biden administration continue to back Israel's war effort in the face of growing opposition in the president's party before a crucial election? And will Netanyahu and his coalition survive the war? All these questions and more will stand at the focus of today's discussion, and I wish all of us a fruitful conference. Thank you.